Hi guys, welcome back to another makeup and true crime video. I'm trying to film more of these videos for you guys, so if you do enjoy these, make sure to leave a comment down below. Tell me what you want to see next. And if you do like these videos, consider subscribing. It would mean so much to me. And let's talk about today's case. So today's case is Australia's version of the Chris Watts case, but it happened like way before Chris Watts crime did. And I'm not sure any country wants to claim a crime similar to what Chris Watts did, but here we are. And I just want to make it clear that today's case, the details can be incredibly distressing. It's going to be really hard for me to even talk about, but just wanted to give that warning. So let's get into the case. So this case is based on the Sharp family and it's sometimes known as the Mornington monster case or the spear gun killer case. Yep, I'm sure your mind is going there. So the Sharp family consisted of John Sharp, the husband, the mother Anna Kemp Sharp, and they had a little daughter called Gracie Sharp. So John Sharp was born on 28th February 1967 in Mornington, and John also grew up in Mornington, which is like a beachy seaside village area in Victoria, Australia. It's got great wineries, restaurants, beaches, and it's like a beautiful little town. John wasn't a social person, and he was known to be socially awkward and shy and he didn't have a lot of friends and he also didn't seem like a very confrontational person. John met Anna in 1993 or 1994 when they both worked together at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia which is like one of our major banks here and John was 27 at the time and Anna was 31 so she was four years older than John and Anna was actually born in New Zealand on 27th September 1963 and she later moved down to the Mornington area in Australia and their relationship progressed super quickly and by October 1994 they were already married and they stayed in the Mornington Peninsula area. They moved from different houses but they stayed in that general area and I'm telling you guys like never rush into a marriage because immediately after their honeymoon Anna calls up her mother and she's like oh my god I fucked up and she explained that there was like no passion between her and John and I mean look at him he looks dead in his eyes but there was no passion no love and she was kind of just like well I made my bed I may as well just lay in it and this was more so because Anna was a devout Catholic and especially at the time divorce was highly looked down upon and her whole family and even her mother, they believed Anna rushed into this marriage. Possibly because when she met John, she was 31 at the time, she had never been married, she had no kids. And maybe she thought her time was running out, so she was like, here's this guy, he'll do, let's just get married. <laughs> so for the next seven years, they just lived this average married life. They moved around from place to place, but they remained in that Mornington area. And they would buy homes, renovate them, sell them, and they would make a really good living doing that. John also moved on from the bank and he ended up opening his own conveyancing firm, which is actually what I do as a lawyer here. And conveyancing in Australia is basically helping people buy and sell homes. So you do all the paperwork and legalities acting for the vendor and the purchaser. Such a fun job. So in 2001, Anna finds out she's pregnant and she was so, so happy. And I can imagine she was already in her late thirties and us women, we feel so much pressure to get married and have kids by a certain age. And at that point in her life, if she's married to this guy, feeling no passion, no love, no excitement, a baby, oh my God, a baby is like a new beginning and something to just to live for really. So when John found out they were expecting a baby, he was just like, Oh shit. He was not excited at all and he didn't even want kids. And something I question about this case is like, okay, but like when you got married, did you discuss children? Did you just get married hoping things would work itself out? Like, and if you really didn't want kids, like why not make it clear? So in August 2002, their daughter Gracie was born and she was actually born with a condition called hip dysplasia. And I'm familiar with this because when my son was born, they wanted to test him for that because his hips would like click. So they ended up sending him to get an ultrasound and everything was fine. But that's how they diagnose it with an ultrasound. And I think it sounds worse than it is. But if a baby has this condition, they usually have to wear a hip brace for a few months and it resolves itself. And I'm not minimizing this condition at all. I can imagine it being super tough on the child having to wear a brace for so many hours a day. But, you know, 
what I'm saying is it can be resolved. So Gracie had to wear an orthopedic corrective harness for the first three months of her life on her hips. And she cried a lot and she had a lot of difficulty sleeping. And look, a newborn itself is such a challenge for the parents. And the poor baby, like they've just come out of a safe space in your room and there are people and lights and all these strange things in the world that they're probably so scared of. And then on top of that, add a harness into the situation and it takes newborn life to a whole different level. And if you haven't had kids or don't know anyone, you know, who's had kids, the first three months of a baby's life is so crucial and it can literally be torture. It's like no sleep for the parents, no sleep for the baby sometimes. And the baby cries a lot during that period. They're just kind of adjusting to the outside world. It's called the fourth trimester. And it must be even more difficult if the baby has a condition to deal with. You definitely need support and help during those early months of a child's life, for sure. So it's no surprise that John, who didn't even want kids, had trouble dealing with Gracie. And this caused a huge strain on their already like meh marriage. Even after the harness was removed, Gracie had a lot of difficulty sleeping and feeding. Duh, because she's a baby. And Anna ended up actually seeking professional help for this because I'm sure John was no help. John felt like Gracie was a huge burden and it took away from his time with Anna. And Anna obviously did not feel this way. She loved Gracie and she wanted to do anything to make Gracie happy and comfortable. And she actually ended up leaving her job to care for Gracie full time. But like I said before, John was socially awkward and he didn't like confrontation and this translated into his marriage too. He just bottled up his feelings and never said anything to Anna about how he felt. And maybe if he discussed his issues, things would have turned out differently. So financially they were doing well and they ended up buying this cute little house in Mornington in 2003. And then later that year, Anna found out she was pregnant with her second child. And this this time it was a baby boy. Anna was so excited about this over the moon and she was so excited that she had a girl and a boy now. And she even named him earlier on in the pregnancy. She named him Francis. And again, this is so similar to the Chris Watts case where Shanann names her baby Nico before 15 weeks of pregnancy or something like that. And at this same time, John bought a spear gun, which is what they normally use for spear fishing. And he bought this from a local shop in Mornington and he would practice with it in his backyard, even though before this he had never shown any signs of being interested in spearfishing. And he also purchased this gun with cash so as to not leave a paper trail. You know where this is going. So Anna was here thinking that John would share in the excitement of their second pregnancy, but nope, John didn't even go to the ultrasound to find out the gender of the baby. What a douche lord, for real. I can't even imagine going through a pregnancy alone. Whether it's your first or second child, it's such a special moment in your life. Those ultrasounds are so exciting and you get to finally see a glimpse of what's growing inside of you. And that person helped you create this baby, like why don't you wanna be a part of it? So the following year after they had been living in their new house for a while, Anna had her friend sleep over and her friend stated that the couple just seemed normal, that they didn't seem like they had any issues. And then later on, on 21st March 2004, they all attended a nephew's birthday party. And again, friends at the party state that everything was just normal. But you know, most friends, unless they're super close to you, they're not really paying close attention to someone's relationship and what's going on. So who really knows what was going on? Then on 23rd March 2004, John and Anna get into a fight, but we don't know what the fight was about. And now the details can be quite graphic. So I'll put a timestamp on the screen where you can skip these details. Or if you wanna click off, I totally will understand. So around nine to 10 p.m. that night, Anna goes to sleep after their fight. And she's around five months pregnant at this time. And John just stayed up and he was just miserable after that fight and he felt he was in a miserable marriage and he wasn't enjoying his life and he wasn't excited about the second baby on the way. And it was basically just not the life that he wanted. So John enters his garage, retrieves his spear gun, went back up to the bedroom where Anna was sleeping in the bed and he positioned the gun only a few centimeters away from 
Anna's left temple and he fired the spear into her skull. This shot didn't stop Anna's breathing. So John took the second spear that he had bought with the gun and he fired it right next to the first shot. He then covered up her body in towels so he didn't have to deal with the body or look at the blood. And he went downstairs and slept on the sofa bed. The next day, John takes Gracie to daycare, drops her off, picks her up, like nothing ever happened. And that day, a TV repairman actually came to the house, but John kind of like prevented him from coming inside, just said his TV was fine because he had his dead wife upstairs in the bed. So after the TV repairman left, John goes up to the body and tries to retrieve the spears from Anna's head, but this was too difficult to get out. So John ends up screwing the shafts, like the barrels away from the spear and just pulls those out. And he left the spearheads inside Anna. And then he went to his backyard, he dug a shallow grave and he buried her in the dirt. And then his deception begins. Anna and her mother were super close. And like I mentioned before, Anna confided in her mother after the honeymoon how unhappy she was and what a mistake she had made in the marriage. So they would talk all the time on the phone and Anna's mother still lived in New Zealand where she was originally from. So the day after John did this to Anna, her mother actually rang her and wanted to speak with her. And John said, oh, she's taken Gracie to daycare. She'll be back later. And then the next day, Anna's mother calls again. And John's like, oh, she's gone to get the groceries. She'll she'll call you back. And then every time Anna's mother wanted to speak to Anna, he'd always have some excuse. And Anna also wasn't answering her mobile phone. So Anna's mother started to become obviously very suspicious. And I'm guessing she starts questioning John on this. And he ends up making up this lie saying, Anna has left me for another man. She's gone off, she's had an affair on me. And she said she's gonna come back on Sunday, pick up Gracie and she's leaving me. And she's moving to Chelsea, which is another suburb in the area to be with this other man. So he then realizes that, okay, for this lie to become believable, Gracie has to go. So he ends up going back to that original fishing shop where he picked up that first spear gun and he goes to buy another spear. This time he actually takes Gracie with him to the shop when he was buying this additional spear to use on Gracie. Like how like how sick is that? And this really hurts me because how? How can you stand there holding your little daughter's hand, walking her around this store? And she was probably confused, like where is my mother? Because clearly she was close with Anna. Anna was the one who would take care of her. Anna was with her full time. And this little human relies on you, trusts you, needs you. Oh my God. And you take her with you to buy the instrument that's going to cause her death. Like this is so sick. So this next part can be distressing for some. So if you need to skip ahead, I will try and put a timestamp so you can move past it. So on the night of Saturday, 27th March, 2004, John puts Gracie to bed and begins to down multiple glasses of whiskey and Coke and basically makes himself intoxicated. While he's intoxicated, he goes back to his garage and loads his spear gun with the new spear that he had bought with Gracie that day or the day before. He goes to Gracie's bed where she's sleeping and aims the weapon at her head. So police think that John was either drunk or he closed his eyes because he shoots the spear gun into Gracie's head and the first shot penetrates her skull, but it doesn't end her life. Gracie screams with agony while the spear is lodged in her head. And then John panics and he goes and gets the two metal shafts that he had pulled out of Anna's head. But remember, he couldn't get the spears out. So all he had was the headless spears and he used these headless shafts to shoot Gracie two more times in her skull. These two shots also didn't end Gracie's life. She's there screaming in pain with three instruments in her skull. So then John ends up, oh my God, pulling out that first spear that he shot her with from Gracie's skull and he reloads the gun and took the last fatal shot. It took four shots for Gracie's life to end. So I'm guessing he ends the night by going to sleep. I don't know, because the next day, John covers his face with a towel as he couldn't bear to look at what he had done to his own daughter, who was only 19 months old at this time. 
a little baby. And he pulls out the spears from Gracie's head. He then wraps her body up in garbage bags, secures the body with duct tape, and then disposes of his baby girl at the Mornington Tip, which is like a huge dump yard, along with some of her toys and the weapons he used to end her life. And then for the next couple of days, John just keeps up the lies surrounding Anna's disappearance. He also ends up sending fake emails from Anna's account to her family claiming that she was happy, safe, and that the baby that she was pregnant with, baby Francis, was not actually John's baby, but she was actually pregnant by this new mystery man. But these emails and explanations by John about where Anna was actually had the opposite effect on Anna's family. Her family was like, no way, this does not sound like Anna. She's a devout Catholic. There's no way she would have done any of this, let alone do all this and not even tell her mother who she was super close with. So on 29th March, 2004, Anna's mother reports Anna as missing in Dunedin, New Zealand, to the police there where she was originally from. So then that same day, John ends up going to Bunnings, which is like our local hardware store, in a suburb called Frankston, and he bought a roll of duct tape, two poly tarps, and a electrical chainsaw. Over the next few days, John dug up Anna's body from the backyard, sawed her body into three parts, and then put the parts in garbage bags and then ties them up with duct tape. He put all of these parts into a large blue sports bag and disposed of her in the same place as he did Gracie, which was the Mornington tip. As the cleanup of the home and the evidence continued, so did his bullshit lies. John disposes of the two bloody mattresses, so Gracie's crib mattress and then their mattress that they shared as a couple and he continued sending fake emails to Anna and her family and then he also sent his mother-in-law flowers and a card for Mother's Day but he wrote on the card and her mom was like this isn't Anna's writing like pretty sure a mother will know their child's handwriting after all those years. So then on 20th May 2004 the New Zealand police end up contacting Victoria police and they tell them, you know, you need to investigate into the disappearance of Anna. So as the police were searching for Anna, they obviously had their eyes on John, but John just continued playing the poor husband victim role that Anna ran off with another man. And he even appeared on a news press conference pleading for Anna to return or to contact them and to contact her family so that they knew that Anna and Gracie were safe. John went on the news stating, Anna, our marriage may be over, but I still love you. And you're the mother of our beautiful daughter, Gracie, who I adore more than anything else. And then he even signed a written declaration to the police, the Victoria police, stating that he had nothing to do with Anna's disappearance. So on 10th June, 2004, the police interviewed John, but he just kept up with his original story and that she ran off with Gracie to be with another man. And he kept going on about how Anna would contact him on her mobile. And that was proof that Anna was alive, but she was just choosing to stay secretive. So the police was like, yeah, okay, dude. And then they ended up putting him on surveillance. So then one day when the police was tracking John, they see him go down to a local beach area near a public toilet block and he reaches into this bush near the toilet block and he pulls out this plastic bag. From that plastic bag, he pulls out a cell phone, pulls out an ATM card, he makes a call on the cell phone, drives down a few minutes to the suburb of Chelsea where he states that Anna was living. He goes to an ATM in Chelsea, uses that ATM card, pulls out $200 and then he goes back to that public toilet block which was in Mount Martha and he puts the card and the phone back in the bag and throws it back in the bush. And then police also saw John disposing of things in garbage bins around the area. And then he later informs the police like, oh my God, you will never believe what happened to me. Anna actually called me and she also pulled out money from our bank, but I think it was in Chelsea, you know, where she's living. That sneaky Anna. And then the police were like, gotcha, bitch. Also, the stuff that John had disposed of in the bins in the surrounding area they were later found to be handwritten notes by John in John's writing, detailing parts of his cover-up story, and he even had, like, a backup story. <laughs> Idiot. So the police then investigate John's home, and in the home they find traces of Anna and Gracie's blood. John is then arrested and charged with both Anna and Gracie's murder. He eventually confesses and then tells police, 
where they can find both Anna and Gracie's bodies. So like I mentioned before, John disposed of Anna and Gracie's body at the Mornington tip, but that tip actually gets transferred to an even bigger tip called the Tarong tip, I believe. And that system was so good that they actually knew which parts of the tip were dumped from which other tips, if that makes sense. So they ended up narrowing down the location of where Gracie and Anna's parts could be to a particular 250 square meter area of the massive tip. It took 10 days of searching for them to find Anna's body. There was a detective called Narelle Fraser that actually found Anna's body in the blue sports bag. And then they ended up finding Gracie the following day. And Narelle actually stayed beside Anna's body in the tip until the rest of the team arrived because she could not bear the thought of leaving Anna alone for a minute longer. And later on, Narelle was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And this later on led to her retirement. During John's interview, he actually actually stated that he murdered Anna because she was moody, controlling, they had a loveless marriage. And obviously the fact that, you know, he never wanted any children played a factor in this. And you know what? If you don't want to have children, then don't have sex. You have to know that having sex can lead to a child. And if you're not willing to be responsible for what may result from the act of sex or be more active in preventing a pregnancy, then don't have sex. Don't bring innocent children into the world just to freaking get rid of them. But when they asked John, you know, why did you kill Gracie? His response was, well, a child needs to be with their mother. But John's family actually believes that there was a separate motive for the murders. They said that John had a history of sexual abuse against children dating back to 20 years before he met Anna, where he molested young members of their circle of family and friends. And apparently he molested a girl and forced another child to molest that girl while he watched. And later on, that girl confronts John when she was an adult. And his response to her was, she was a slut who deserved it. Lovely. So John's family believes that Anna may have caught John molesting Gracie. And then he killed her to prevent this from all coming out. On 5th August 2005, the court sentenced John to two consecutive life terms of imprisonment with a non-parole period of 33 years and John is currently in protective custody. I feel like Australia's sentencing is just so mild compared to other countries I've heard. Like in the US, I'm pretty sure I've heard of criminals getting like 135 years in prison, but I feel like over here, I could be wrong, it's always like around 30 years non-parole. And if criminals actually do get out in that time, they still have a decent life left to live after they've committed these crimes. Anna and Gracie were buried in New Zealand and Gracie's birth and death certificate have now had the father listed as unknown. So that is the case of the Sharp family killings. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. It is always so horrible when we talk about innocent children's lives being taken away. I hope you guys found this video interesting and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I will see you in the next one, guys. Besitos. Thanks for watching.